The pricing of an interest rate swap can feel tedious, but here I'm going to break it down following John Hull's example into its three steps. One, the set of assumptions that were given. Two, extracting the implied forwards from the LIBOR zero or spot rate curve. And finally, three, modeling the cash flows. My illustration reimagines John Hull's example 7-1, so that's in chapter 7 of the 10th edition of his book, and we are conducting evaluation, or we could say that we are pricing a plain vanilla interest rate swap by treating it as a set or series of forward rate agreements. By plain vanilla interest rate swap, I covered the mechanics of that in a previous video. What we mean is it's a fixed for floating exchange. One of the counterparties is going to pay according to a floating rate, in this case, LIBOR. The other counterparty, and we're going to value the swap from the perspective of the other counterparty, which is to say the other counterparty pays a fixed swap rate, in this case, 3%. So the valuation of this plain vanilla interest rate swap is somewhat tedious, but let's just break it down first into the three major steps. First, we have here in the upper section, the set of assumptions given to us by John Hull. We need the assumptions including the swap rate, that's the fixed rate that will pay, be paid by us, the counterparty, and we also need the LIBOR zero rate or spot rate curve. Secondly, we need to, from the zero rate curve, extract the implied forward rates. Why do we want implied forward rates? Because we don't know what our counterparty who is going to pay at the floating rate, we don't know what the future floating rates will be. Our best guess of the future floating rates are the forward rates that are, Im that are embedded or implied in the zero rate curve. Once extracted, we can then do the third step, which is the modeling of the cash flows, where we look at each of the exchange uh, dates on which cash flows are exchanged, we net those, payments to determine the future cash flow stream, discount those to present value, sum those, and we'll get a current value of the swap. And you'll notice where we're going to end up here. These are in millions. This value of the swap to us is going to be positive, about $511,000. So going back to the first step, in terms of the assumptions which are given to us in the problem, and as usual, I've highlighted them in yellow, they include a notional of 100 million, a swap rate of 3%. So that's what where the institution is going to pay this fixed swap rate of 3%. Now, as usual, interest rates should always be as input. When we're dealing with inputs or even in outputs, we generally want to express them in per annum terms. And that's the case here. A 3% swap meet, a 3% swap rate implies 3% per annum. However, these cash flows are going to be exchanged every six months, we can see on the timeline. And so that means as the fixed rate payer, we're paying 3% of the notional, which is 3% times 100 million or 3 million, but it's two periods per year. So it's 1.5 million every six months. That gets us 3 million per year. As the fixed rate payer, we already know that's going to be our obligation. So that side of the swap is very straightforward. Less straightforward is how we treat these floating rate payments that we can't really predict. Well, we need assumptions. And the first one, highlight in yellow here, is what the six-month LIBOR was three months ago. Why are we given that assumption by John Hall that I've extra yellow highlighted with 2.9? Well, this swap is not, we are not pricing the swap at inception when it's originated. After all, the swap's value at inception was, would be zero. There's really no exercise to do. That would be a very convenient problem. What we're instead told as part of the assumptions here in John Hull's example 7.1 is that the swap has a remaining life of 1.25 years. And we also know that the swap is going to exchange cash flows every six months. So that means the final cash flow is in 15 months, 1.25 years. And that means that we would just subtract, we can mentally subtract six months to determine that the cash flow prior to that is going to be at nine months or 0.75 years. 
and the cash flow part of that is going to be at three months or 0.25 years. And that's going to be the next cash flow as we sit here at time zero trying to value the swap. See how the easiest thing to do, I think, is just to work backwards there. When we're told the remaining life is 15 months, we can figure out that, well, there are three more cash flows to be settled in this swap. Another feature of the plain vanilla interest rate swap that I covered in the previous video is the fact that if we just imagine here a six month period, the fact that interest is determined here at the beginning of the period, but it is paid at the end of the period, or we could think about that, think of that as in arrears. And we have again, six month periods. When we're valuing here today, we're halfway into a, we're halfway in the middle of a six month period. So the floating rate payment was actually already determined. It was the six month LIBOR three months ago. And that LIBOR was 2.90%. Again, that's a six month LIBOR. The floating, the, the payments are being exchanged every six months. So the floating rate is a six month LIBOR. But again, 2.9% is per annum. So three months ago, six month LIBOR was 2.9%. And then the full period is six months. So that means the in plus three months or plus 0 0.025 years will be the exchange of cash flows, the 0.25. So the 2.9% determines, you can see here, skipping down, the floating rate cash flow is going to be 2.9% multiplied by the notional is 2.9 million, but divided by two because it's semi-annual, that gets us the 1.45 million. And that's why in three months, the floating rate payment will be 1.45 million because it's based on the six month LIBOR that prevailed three months prior. That's why that assumption is explicitly given to us by John Hall so we did, that we know what the next floating rate payment will be. Okay, too bad that we're not just off the hook at that point because we would still have two more subsequent floating rate payments to determine, and we don't know what the future six-month LIBOR will be. What we are given, what we can observe, is the spot rate curve or zero rate curve. And those are the zero rates that we currently observe at time zero. We have a three-month LIBOR of 2.8%, a nine-month LIBOR of 3.2% and a 15-month LIBOR of 3.4%. So this, this, is a, these are, this is a longer term spot rate. And this LIBOR curve, this LIBOR spot rate curve then serves two functions for us. The first is, as usual in finance, it's going to provide for us the risk-free rate that we use to discount future cash flows to the present. So it informs the discount factors. And in fact, John Hull, and when we do that, as, as usual, we want to be mindful of the compound frequency. John Hull specifies these as, for example, 3.4% is the 15 months LIBOR with continuous compounding. We need to know the compound frequency. When he tells us that 3.4% is continuous compounding, that means if we want the discount factor here for 15 months, I would notate, notate that this way. I could say small d for discount factor, 1.25 years is going to equal e to the negative. You can see 3.4% times 1.25 years. Because it's continuous compounding, we can use the elegant exponential function, function to determine the discount factor, which of course is the multiplier that multiplies on the future cash flow to give us a present value. And um, similarly, we have the full set of discount factors that together we can call the discount function. So the LIBOR spot or zero rate curve cont with continuous compounding that informs this discount factor, that's its first function. Its second function gets to the second step here in this exercise, which is that we need it, we use it to extract the implied forward rates, which are our best estimate under pure expectations theory of what the future unknowable six-month LIBOR will be. How do we do that? Well, 
Here in the first row, I've just copied the uh, LIBOR zero or spot rate con uh, with continuous compounding. So I've just copied them down. And then in this row, I've extracted the implied forward rates that are also continuous by definition. And I've covered the mechanics of that in a previous video, my uh, topic two quantitative methods playlist. The calculation is not complicated at all when the rates are continuous like this. But what they tell us is that this 3.4, for example, the way that I would annotate that, 3.4% here is informed again by the zero rate curve and it is a implied forward rate with continuous compounding beginning in three months going to nine months. So you can see the span there is six months. So it's a six month forward rate beginning in three months. And so a little difficult there because it's located here and this 3.4% is then, you could think of that visually as the implied forward rate here in this span. And then, then with respect to the six month forward rate that begins in nine months, that's the 3.7%, right? So we could say 3.7% is the forward rate with continuous compounding that begins in nine months extends to 1.25. So it's a six month forward rate beginning in nine months and that's the 3.7% spans this area. So that 3.4% and the 3.7% are the extracted or implied six month forward rates and they are implied by the zero rate curve. Only problem with that is they are with continuous compounding so that we do need to be mindful of translating them to their semi-annual equivalents, which are going to be just a little bit higher. And that's because the cash flows, this is not a discounting here. This is the termination of the cash flows. And they're going to be based on the semi-annual rate, not a continuous rate. Cash flows pay lumpy or in discrete. They don't pay in continuous form. So those are the two forward rates I need. I already have the 2.9%. That concludes the second step, leaving us only with this third and final step, which is to model the cash flows. And the floating cash flows follow the here, the implied forward rates. For example, in nine months, the floating rate, that's our counterparty. The counterparty's pay, the floating rate is going to pay 3.4% times the notional divided by two is 1.71 million, or at least that's our best prediction as to what the floating rate pair will pay. We, as the counterparty who pays fixed, will pay 1.5 million. We already know that, it doesn't change. And you'll notice that means we receive more than we pay, that for this cash flow, we, we would project that we, are pay that we will receive $215,000, just like over here on the first cash flow. Our, this 2.9 informs a 1.45 floating rate payment uh, received by us, which is less than our 1.5. So our first cash flow is modeled as you can see here, actually a negative that, that we are, it's gonna net such that we are paying 50,000, right? There's a netting here, that, which is just modeled as a simple subtraction. That's because in actually in the swap, there is a netting. So in the second cash flow, then it's modeling, we're gonna receive 215,000. And the third and final cash flow, again, this 1.87 million is informed by the implied forward rate. Our best estimate as to what that floating rate payer will pay us is 1.87 million. We're only gonna pay 1.5. That nets to a positive 367,000 to us. So this row here, is by subtracting simulates the netting and it's the stream of future cash flows. Well, we only need to multiply each of those by the discount factor to get the stream of present value. And of course, summing the present value stream gives us the value or price of this swap to us from our perspective as the pay fixed. And it is, you can see positive 0.5117 million, which is positive 500 and eleven thousand seven hundred dollars and that's the exercise here one first step assumptions second step extract the implied forward rates with some annual compounding third step model the cash flows 
as we would project them to be. And so the just the final uh, exhibit I have on here is not actually shown in a in whole uh, seven one in the tenth edition anyway. But this is the uh, old school way of doing it. We value the swap not as uh, forward rate agreements, but as if it were two bonds. So our set of assumptions are the same. And actually, if this is a simpler way to value the swap, more traditional way. However, it relies on one key assumption. And the key assumption is that it's the same single interest rate, which in this case is LIBOR, is both the risk-free rate used for discounting and also the rate used to determine the floating rate payment. If that's true, we can make an assumption here with respect to this first cash flow in three months. And you'll notice the 1.45 million is the same. It's based on half of the six month LIBOR that was prevailing at the beginning of the period, 1.45 million. But you'll notice in this approach, valuing as two bonds, we've added 100 million or we've added the notional. Now, the interest rate swap, it's notion called notional, not principal. There is no exchange of the $100 million. It's just referenced. We add it here because we're valuing each of these as if they were bonds. And here we have available to us, because we're able to make that assumption that there's only the LIBOR rate that is used for both the risk-free rate discounting and the floating rate determination, we're able to rely on the idea that that floating rate bond or like a floating rate note prices exactly to par at each coupon date, which is the truth of it. That is to, that's because a higher LIBOR is a greater coupon, but is offset exactly by a higher discount rate. So in three months, this bond would price exactly to 100 million. And that price would incorporate the future, any future assumptions of rate changes. So it's a shortcut allowed to us that gives us the, we were able to model the floating uh, rate side of the swap if we model it as a bond as only a single cash flow. And then we multiply again as before by the discount factor to get a present value. And the present value of that floating rate bond that has a single cash flow in three months is 100 million, 740,000. And then the fixed, uh, the, the other side, the counterparty, where the counterparty paying is similar um, to, the, to the other approach. We know there's a $1.5 million uh, cash flow in the swap that's fixed. Only difference here is at the end, we're treating this to be consistent as if it were a bond. If it were a bond, there would be a return of principal. So this is not what actually happens with the swap. This is the under the as two bonds approach. We include that principal at the end so that we have a stream of future cash flows multiplied by the discount factors gives a stream of present values. Sum those just as if we were pricing a bond. This is standard bond pricing exercise here. So on the fixed rate side, the price of that bond would be 100 million 230,000 and the difference of those you'll notice it's exactly the same it's 511,700 showing that there is a consistency here in this approach where we value the swap as if it were two bonds so those are the two approaches for flow uh, as a set of forward rate agreements probably more modern and more flexible and that's all for the uh, plain valuation of the plain vanilla interest rate swap. If, if this video was helpful, please subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified of my future videos. Thank you.